In this video, you're going to learn everything you need to know to implement Q learning from scratch. You don't need any prior exposure to Q learning. You don't even really need much familiarity with reinforcement learning. You'll get everything you need in this video. If you're new here, I'm Phil, and I'm here to help you get started with machine learning. I upload three videos a week, so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. Imagine you've just gotten the recognition you deserve in the form of offers for a machine learning engineering position from Google, Facebook, and Amazon. All three are offering you a boatload of money, and your dreams of big balling are interrupted by the realization that starting salary is just, well, the starting salary. You've got friends at each of the three companies, so you reach out to find out about the promotion schedules with each. Facebook offers $250,000 to start with a 10% raise after three years, but with a 40% probability that you'll quit. Google offers $200,000 to start with a 20% raise after three years, but with only a 25% probability that you'll quit. Amazon offers $350,000 to start with a 5% raise after five years, with a 60% chance that you'll end up washing out. So which should you take? All three offer big money, but future raises are far from certain. This is the sort of problem reinforcement learning is designed to solve. How can an agent maximize long-term rewards in environments with uncertainties? Q-learning is a powerful solution because it lets agents learn from the environment in real time and quickly learn novel strategies for mastering the task at hand. Q-learning works by mapping pairs of states and actions to the future rewards the agent expects to receive. It decides which actions to take based on a strategy called Epsilon Greedy Action Selection. Basically, the agent spends some time taking random actions to explore the environment and the remainder of the time selecting actions with the highest known expected future rewards. Epsilon refers to the fraction of the time the agent spends exploring and it's a model hyperparameter between 0 and 1. You can gradually decrease Epsilon over time to some finite value so that your agent eventually converges on a mostly greedy strategy. You probably don't want to set Epsilon at zero exactly, since it's important to always be testing the agent's model of the environment. After selecting and taking some action, the agent gets its reward from the environment. What sets Q-learning apart from many reinforcement learning algorithms is that it performs its learning operation after each time step, instead of at the end of each episode, as is the case with policy gradient methods. At this point, it's important to make a distinction. Traditional Q-learning works by literally keeping a table of state and action pairs. If you're implementing this in Python, you could use a dictionary with state and action tuples as keys. This is only feasible in environments with a limited number of discrete states and actions. Here, the agent doesn't need to keep track of its history since it can just update the table in place as it plays the game. The way the agent updates its memory is by taking the difference in expected returns between the actions it took with the action that had the highest possible future returns. This ends up biasing the agent's estimates over time towards the actions that end up producing the best possible outcomes. When we're dealing with environments that have a huge number of states, or a state space that is continuous, then we really can't use a table. In that case, we have to use deep neural networks to take these observations of the environment and turn them into discrete outputs that correspond to the value of each action. This is called deep Q learning. The reason we have to use neural networks is that they are universal function approximators. It turns out that deep neural nets can approximate any continuous function, which is precisely what we have. The relationship between states, actions, and future returns is a function that the agent wants to learn so it can maximize its future rewards. Deep Q learning agents have a memory of the states they saw, the actions they took, and the rewards they received. During each learning step, the agent samples a subset of this memory to feed these states through its neural network and compute the values of the actions it took. Just like with regular Q-learning, the agent also computes the values for the maximal actions and uses the difference between the two as its loss function to update the weights of the neural network. So let's talk implementation. In practice, we end up with two deep neural networks. One network, called the evaluation network, is to evaluate the current state and see which action to take, and another network, called the target network, that is used to calculate the value of maximal actions during the learning step. The reasoning for why you need two networks is a little complicated, but basically it boils down to eliminating bias in the estimates of the values of the actions. The weights of the target network are periodically updated with the weights of the evaluation network so that the estimates of the maximal actions can get more accurate over time. 
If you're dealing with an environment that gives pixel images, just like in the Atari library from the OpenAI Gym, then you will need to use a convolutional neural network to perform feature extraction on the images. The output from the convolutional network is flattened and then fed into a dense neural network to approximate the values of each action for your agent. If the environment has movement, as most do, then you have an additional problem to solve. If you take a look at this image, can you tell which way the ball or paddle is moving? It's pretty much impossible for you to get a sense of motion from just a single image, and this limitation applies to the deep Q learning agent as well. This means you'll need a way of stacking frames to give the agent a sense of motion. So to be clear, this means that the convolutional neural network takes in the batch of stacked images as input rather than a single image. Choosing an action is reasonably straightforward. Generate a random number, and if it's less than the epsilon parameter, pick an action at random. If it's greater than the agent's epsilon, then feed the set of stacked frames through the evaluation network to get the values for all the actions in the current state. Find the maximal action and take it. Once you get the new state back from the environment, add it to the end of your stacked frames, and store the stacked frames, actions, and rewards in the agent's memory. Then, perform the learning operation by sampling the agent's memory. It's really important to get a non-sequential random sampling of the memory so that you avoid getting trapped in one little corner of parameter space. As long as you keep track of the state transitions, actions, and rewards in the same way, this should be pretty safe. Feed that random batch of data through the evaluation and target networks and then compute the loss function to perform your loss minimization step for the neural network. That's really all there is to DeepQ learning. A couple neural networks, a memory to keep track of states, and lots of GPU horsepower to handle the training. Speaking of which, of course, you'll need to pick a framework, preferably one that lets you use a GPU for the learning. PyTorch and TensorFlow are both great choices and both support model checkpointing. This will be critical if you have other stuff to do and can't dedicate a day or so for model training. That's it for now. Make sure to share the video if you found it helpful and subscribe so you don't miss any future reinforcement learning content. I'll see you in the next video.